one thing that Belgium and France have in common are the cobblestones or the pave. France's big race, Paris du Bay, Belgium's big event is the Tour de Flanders, and today it's a day for the Belgians. If anything you know, this race has become more popular than ever. Hello again, everybody. I'm Phil Liggett, and welcome to the Ronda. It's a race of 256 kilometres. It's famous for its 15 small climbs. And one of those climbs this year might play a more significant part. The old Quarrement, no longer one of the early climbs, now it ranks number seven. And of course, the Belgians have the world champion in Johan Museo. Over the past five years, I think he has been the star of this race. He's had two wins, two seconds, and a third. Well, we're in a quiet square here, but outside in the city of St. Nicholas, everything is happening. The riders are signing on, and Paul Sherwin is there with them. Thanks, Phil. Well, just at the start line here, we're with Max Chandry, who's always been one of the great riders in the Tour of Flanders. Max, it's a nice day for the race today. How are the legs? Legs are pretty good, uh, the morale is good, the condition is good, the weather is good, <laughs> basically, is good. basically everything's good. But this is different, this Tour of Flanders, because there's a lot more climbs in the last part of the race. It's going to make it very difficult. Yeah, it's going to make it very difficult, you know, you're used to a certain type of, uh, of race, you know, I mean, I mean the same course every year, and this year's changed, so it's going to be something new, something to look out about, and... You have to be pretty careful on who's going away, how, how early or how late. Axel, a new team. You're wearing number one in the team. You're one of the team leaders. How are your chances for today? Well, we'll see uh, towards the race. I hope I'll still be present in the final and then everything can happen. If you still have the, the legs, you can try something in the final. Today's the race really for a strong man because all of the climbs are in the last few kilometers. Yeah, it's very important to be... Uh, in good condition, over the 200 k's, you, you you must be able to to digest really good the the cobblestones after 200 k's and then come to climb. So, I think it's going to be a really strong guy who's going to win today. Tour of Flanders is a very special race. You like these races with the cobblestones, Paris Roubaix, and especially this one, the Tour of Flanders. Yeah, it's a it's a special race. It's different with the pavé and. Uh, you know, throughout the rest of the year you do 100 races on the normal roads up and down like this, but this is different with the cobbles and all the turns and racing here in Belgium, so it's a, it's a classic, it's a, it's a true word for it. The team's had a very hard time this year, you lost Kevin Livingstone who had an excellent form in Milan San Remo, but what are your chances today? I'm hoping for the best, uh, I felt good in Milan San Remo, I was a little tired last week so I rested up mainly to get ready for uh, this race and for next Sunday for Roubaix. So going to see uh, how it is. The course is completely different, so it's going to change uh, the t old tactics that used to work. It's not going to be the same. It's going to be new for everyone, so it's going to be interesting to see what happens. Johan, we're at the start of the Tour of Flanders, and just a few days ago, nobody thought you were going to be here because of the big crash in Milan San Remo, but it looks as if you've come back. The last day, uh, I come, every day I come back, so uh, the last days of the, of the pan, I was already good, and uh, every day I come, I come better, so um, it's, it's better to start when you have a good condition, because uh, with the so old jersey, I don't want to start with a uh, with a bad condition because everybody. Uh, yeah. I want I want to do race good, surely in the in the Tour of Flanders because it's uh, it's a little bit my race. But this is a very different Tour of Flanders because all the climbs are at the end. It's going to be a slightly different tactics for this race. It's, this year is different, but uh, nobody knows how it's uh, how it's going this year. So uh, everybody wait a little bit, and we shall see at the end. It's a special day for you, your hand, to be able to ride the Tour of Flanders with the rainbow jersey. Uh, it's the first time, so uh, it's something special, yeah. Everybody look to me today. Thanks. Good luck. Yeah. I think they look to him every year because he's been in the top three for the last four years, Johan Museo. This man was third last year, Franco Ballerini. The traditional signing on here in the marketplace in St. Nicholas. And here's the winner one year ago, Amicola Bartoli, who also rode well in Milan San Remo with fifth place. But not quite as well as this man, who's now wearing the leader's jersey of the World Cup. Winner of the first World Cup race, Milan San Remo, this year. And this is Eric Zabel. He is having a tremendous season. Laurent Jalabert the man who got blamed for causing the crash in the closing metres of Milan San Remo when he collided with Johan Museo all smiles again now Alex Zula the other top man on the Onse team and Alex and uh, Laurent they vie it seems uh, for first place in the top world rankings at the moment 
This is a Belgian rider, a lot of Belgian think could come up with a good ride today. Peter van Pietergem, the man who already this year has won Het Volk, but he could also be very good next week in Paris-Roubaix. And there you see the massive crowd. This is the self-proclaimed fastest man in the world, Mario Cipollini. All smiles at the start. And this is his countryman, Gabriella Colombo, now a third-year pro, winner last year of Milan San Remo. He crashed out of the hunt this time around. Now he's here in the Tour of Flanders. All smiles too for Andre Schmil, winner of Paris Bay in the past, and a man who always rides well in these early season classic races. In all, there are 25 teams on the start line today. This is seen as one of the classic of the year it's the race everybody wants to win and as you can see it's a beautiful day in Belgium blue skies facing up to a very tough course indeed and judging by the flag there it's going to be quite a little windy one as well gentle roll away now let's have a look at the route they face there's 15 climbs on this course of 256 kilometers the first climb coming after 114 kilometers then they come thick and fast all the way down to the finish in Mia Baker well, Phil, the next climb the riders are going to face is the Notterberg, which is actually on the opposite side of the old Quarimo. It's a little climb that they take up to the top of the, the opposite side of the old Quarimo, and then they descend down there along the valley, and then they start what is one of the hardest climbs in the final phase of this year's Tour of Flanders. And it is, I think, for a lot of riders going to be very strange indeed, because the old Quarimo has been moved so close to the finish. And this is climb number seven, and you can see it already, there's a split on down there. Andrea Taffy, the Italian Mappe rider, is out in front, showing a little bit of sign of early form in the Tour of Langkawi in Malaysia, where he grabbed a couple of stage wins, but he hasn't done too much since then. And Eric Zabel coming at a rush down there with all his telecom team around him. Eric in the white jersey as World Cup leader, and that's a first for him. And he's got his team organised, and so they've got themselves a nice little line out going here. Well, it's difficult playing catch-up in a, in a race like the Tour of Flanders. In fact, he's just missed out on one of the splits in the earlier climbs there, and he's got Rolf Aldag at the front here trying to pace him back in. But if you're riding a race like the Tour of Flanders, every time that you pace yourself back like this, you're using up just a little bit more energy. And I think by the end of the day, it's going to be very difficult for Eric Zabel to keep his lead in the World Cup competition. There's Zabel, just about in our shot here. And when I look at him like this, he often reminds me of the great Sean Kelly, the Irishman, the way he sits, a very compact and forward on his bike. Typical sprinter's position, but of course, to, to win the spin here, you've got to be able to hold your own on the little bergs all the way down to the finish. This is the Knochterberg, 2.3 kilometres of climbing now. It is not that steep, it's around about 11% the gradient, uh, but all of these little climbs are crucial. They're always on narrow roads, and that's the peculiarity of the Tour of Flanders. These are the hills still to go. We finish with the Bosberg, and uh, you may remember Edric van Hooyedonk, who won this race a couple of times. We always call him the boss on the Bosberg because that's where he made his winning move. To that little group there with Eric Zabel just about to come back into contention there they'll just get onto the back of that leading group of about 35 riders just at the foot of this climb of the Notterberg and as you said it's not one of the tougher climbs and in fact it isn't a cobbled climb it's a, a tarmac climb and it gets tougher as you get up to the top but everybody would like to stay in the position that they're in going along a climb like this because what happens is there are always accidents at the back somebody's looking for the gear he over geared himself coming up the early slopes of the climb makes a mistake and then falls off and then again you're playing this catch-up game you see those two riders on the left hand side there taking risks to make sure that they can get to the front try and get in the front line because then at least they're out of danger and there's the banner to announce the start of the little hill and just look at this the narrow road so all you've got to do is get to the front and then you can ride at your own speed because nobody can get past you it's not quite as easy as it sounds a very compact group indeed. Greatly reduced from the big start earlier today. The riders now beginning their tour of the hills. And there is the gradient, 11%, just over one kilometre of climbing. And 89 metres they actually climb in elevation. But it's short and sharp. Well, I think that very fast start by these riders is going to tell in the closing stages of the Tour of France. They took off about 47 kilometres an hour for the first hour. Lots of men trying to get clear, but at the end of the day, it is still basically all together going into the final phase, the crucial stage of the climbs. The rider there on the left-hand side in the orange jersey of Rabobank moving to the front. In the white jersey in the middle, in fact, I can just see Maximilian Chiandri. He's looking for a good ride. He's finished sixth in the Tour of Flanders before, so this is the kind of race that he likes. And in fact, very close to the front there in the coffee dish jersey riding on this team for the first time is Frankie Andreu. And that's good to see big Frankie's in the second row of riders nearest the camera here with that red crash helmet on and uh, 
they've won the battle to get to the front so now they can ease back a little bit as they start the climb because as I say nobody can get through as they three or four riders is all it takes to block off the whole road here that's quite often a tactic used uh, by some of the teams by the way they've got strong teams they can block off the whole race and their teammates can get clear here's a little view towards the end of the race here rider number 110 sitting around the back there is Stefan de Jong young professional I saw him win a stage of the Commonwealth Bank Cycle Classic in Terrigal a couple of years ago. He's term pro now, riding for the TVM squad and uh, in the warmth of the peloton. Well, he's a Dutchman and he knows these narrow roads as well as almost anybody else. 128 there was Arvis Pizics from the Rabobank team. Riding in the front line there in the TVM jersey is Johan Kakio, a man who was brought across to this TVM squad because of the fact that he has so many UCI points and it pushed the team up a little bit closer to the top of the, old, or the overall world rankings. This is what it's like at the back. It is very difficult indeed because even though the, the roads are very narrow, once you get to the steep part, you can see, in fact, the man at the back here is really suffering quite a bit. This is Zgevgeny Spruk, the Polish rider on the Mape team. And they won't be too happy with him because they will want a full squad when it comes down to the end because I feel Johan Museo, although he was a little bit quiet at the start, he would really love to win this race for the third time wearing the World Champions jersey on his shoulders. Absolutely, you can bet on it. He loves this race, he doesn't like losing it and he does feel as though he's part owner of it because he's done so well for this past four years. Never outside the top three finish and in that he's actually won the race twice as well. This right at the back here, well off our camera, he in fact slipped his chain and got left behind but he's coming back nicely not panicking he's a professional he'll use the convoy of cars he knows the rides are just ahead and he'll pick his way gently through and get back into the big bunch when they slow down as they are to get round the corner well, you can see there, in fact, in the Ronde van Vlaanderen Straat, the street of the Tour of Flanders. They'll be coming back up this way in about 10 or 15 minutes. They drop now down into the town of Klausberg, and you can see the riders accelerating because they realise how important it is to stay in the front because the next big climb is going to be very tough indeed. And as we've said, it's almost 200 kilometres in the legs so far, and now it's when they're going to start hitting those climbs in a very repetitive nature. 3.8 kilometres to go to the Quaramon. You can see picking up the speed at the front, making sure that nobody comes by you because you've used a lot of energy to stay in the front and you don't want to lose it just by putting the brakes on at this stage of the game. And this is where the pressure has gone on by the riders at the front because they are approaching the Quadamont climb. It's cobbled, it's narrow and they want to get to it first. And the only way to ensure that you do stay at the front is to put the pressure on and stop anybody else making progress. So they've come away from one climb but they're going on to the very serious climb now. It's hill number seven, the Quadamont, and there's a surge down the outside as well. And the sun is high in the sky. It's a beautiful day here in Flanders. It really is a nice place to be in the springtime. The leaves are just popping and the birds are beginning to sing. And the riders in the Tour of Flanders know that the start of a long season ahead of them. There's the gradient for the upcoming Quaramont climb. As I say, now they've moved it further up the rankings. It's much deeper into the course. It's 8% and it is a steep little climb. And the, the pace being set now by TVM. Johan Capio is the rider who's doing pretty well on the team here. And, you know, earlier on this week, because we've had a few days over here with a little group of American riders enjoying uh, the spectacle of the Tour of Flanders, we thought it was a good idea, in fact, to ask Paul Sherwin, who managed to find uh, one of the new strips on the block, the Coffertist team strip, to go out front and do a little bit of riding and relive his heyday, because, of course, Paul rode the Tour of Flanders a number of times, and he rode it with some distinction as well. That's why when he's commentating here alongside me right now, he's saying it with feeling. He's actually remembering all of these roads just like he did in the Tour of Flanders. So earlier on this week we sent Paul Sherwin out on the course and I have to admit some of these pictures you know well they're not as pleasant as you might think because Paul's not quite as fit as he was. So there's the details of the race it's a 10% climb it takes you 91 meters above sea level and now ladies and gentlemen I give you Paul Sherwin. Well, the old Quaramont is still one of the most strategic points of the race here, the Tour of Flanders. And the reason being is because this year it's after 195 kilometres to 60 kilometres to go. So if you have an accident or a problem here, you've got no chance of coming back into the race. But it's always been a strategic point because at this point here, the riders have to be very close to the front of the peloton. You can actually just see how wide the road is. And if you're not in the first five or ten riders and somebody has a problem, you can be so far back you don't come back into the race. Riders take a lot of risks coming into this part of the course and they realize that very soon they get the short cobbled part 
going up to the plateau at the top. Now once they get to that co cobble part at the top, that's when they really open up the gas and the strong men can open up gaps very rapidly indeed. And before we just get to the cobbles here, I can feel that it's a long time since I've been racing up this climb. I rode it six times in the Tour of Flanders, so I'll just take a little bit of a break as we hit the cobbles and I'll talk to you guys again at the top. Well, it may not sound too good, but he certainly looks quite good on the climbs. Now all we've got to do is sit down for a half hour and wait for him to come up into our view. Here he comes. I'd like to say give him a round of applause because he looks pretty good at this point. Paul Sherwin, of course, had a great career, lasted some ten years. Now let's go back to him. You know what, Phil? Sometimes I've got to question my own intelligence. <laughs> Well, I wouldn't do that, Paul. At least you had the intelligence to become a television commentator. That way you can sit in a comfortable seat and watch the riders make the serious effort on these climbs. But what a great deal of enjoyment uh, the riders do give us. Well, Paul, as you can see by his vibration, he's right in the centre of the cobblestones now. So, again, back to him. It's not bad riding the cobbles today, but when the Tour of Flanders comes across here and there's 500,000 people watching, I wouldn't want to make a fool of myself like I am doing this day. Yeah, well, there's probably that many people watching right now, it's just you can't see them, Paul. Anyway, off to Paul's right there is a lovely little cafe. If you come up here, enjoy yourself and watch the race go by. Now, Paul's over the hill. I don't mean that literally. Let's go back to him. This is the part that I always thought was the hardest part of the old Quarimont. In fact, once you've come up that little steep climb, it only lasts about 20 or 30 seconds. But once you get over to the top here, to this plateau, it's always windy, whatever time of year it is and the wind really blows the riders down into the gutter and then the men with the big power like Johan Museo or Laurent Jalabert can use that to their advantage. They get onto the big chain ring and a very small sprocket and power along this straight and that's when the gaps really open up and you'll see, I'm sure, a lot of riders struggling to get back into contention. Right, well, let's have a look how Paul's description has worked out. Paul back alongside me now. He's got his breath back. It only took 48 hours to recover. And now we're looking at the front of the Tour de Flanders here, and it's TVM setting the pace. Well, they've got two riders in the squad, Phil, who are riding very well at the moment. Obviously, Peter van Vietigem, but also Henrik van Dijk, who actually just recently won the Grand Prix E3. So it could well be that they're trying to set up the old Quarimont for one of those riders. But there you can see in the orange jersey on the left-hand side of the picture, Rolf Sorensen. He's been omnipresent this year. He's just recently won the time trial at the final stage of the three days of Lapana. So he's obviously in good shape, too. And TVM have ridden very, very well. They rode well in Milan San Remo. They're right in the action again. Now we're onto the cobble section of the climb where Paul Sherwin was. And again, the attacks are starting. You see Van Pietergem is a real Belgian rider. He's riding right in the middle of the cobblestones, using a lot of power indeed, sitting back in the saddle so they can get as much power into that transmission as possible. In fact, he's opened up quite a considerable gap, and you can see gaps starting to open in the main field. Somebody has to react very quickly now, and I would think we'll be looking for the white jersey of the world champion, Johan Museo, very soon. But Van Pietergem has done a very smart move here. He's gone out, but you can see just how many people have turned out to see the Tour of Flanders. Well, his victory in Hep Volk was all he needed to kick him off and get him going in a good season here because it's amazing how much confidence you get once you do get the win, and a big one at that. He's riding now with supreme confidence. He's got this race strung out on the cobbles. Now there's a massive crowd down there. It was a quiet day when Paul rode up. Just look at the crowd now. Completely transformed the atmosphere of this area, and it is a beautiful area to race in as well. Now, very shortly, uh, Peter will be over the top of the climb, and then he'll make that turn onto the plateau, then he'll feel the strength of the wind, which is quite strong today. There's the main field, or what's left of the advanced uh, slice of the peloton. And you see not all of the riders are going up it at quite the same suplex as Peter van Pietergum. Well, you do see that nearly every one of these riders is climbing the old Quarimont sitting down. That's the only way, really, to handle these cobble climbs and keep a little bit of stability in the machine, because if you start to get out of the saddle, the bike just bounces all over the place. And you can see here, looking for a softer part of the cobbles, a smoother part to get an easier ride, but that is why you have to sit down and use as much power as possible. This is the last part of the sheltered region of the, co the cobbles of the Quarimont there. They're going through the, the, uh, the houses there, they go out onto the plateau, and now they will be able to see just what sort of damage Peter van Pietigem has done. 
Well, he's wanting to know that, answer that very question himself. He's looking over his shoulder. What he's looking for is to see if there's a small group coming his way. That's what he wants now. He doesn't want the big bunch to come back. But I'm not sure. There's a lot of tired riders, even at this stage of the race today. He's got eight seconds over the field, but the field is still more or less all together. This is Bruno Boscardin riding for Festina. He's in fact just changed his nationality from Italian over to Swiss. And right on his wheel, a man who's always consistent in these cobble classics, Andre Schmiel riding for the Lotto squad. He's moved up there. He knows this is a strategic point. But I feel a lot of the riders aren't quite sure today how to handle the old Quarimon because it comes just 60 kilometers from the finish. And in fact, they've picked up Van Peter again very quickly indeed. Now we have three leaders with a little gap over the rest of the main field. And I would say that's still around about the six or seven second mark. Well, they're going to take the move by Schmill, who is a very shrewd rider. He pops up in many of the winning moves in these early season classics. And now they've seen him go across. I think there will be some reaction from the field. Andre Schmill, who is now uh, 34 years of age, he turned pro almost 10 years ago, back in 1989. And his record speaks for itself. He was fourth in this race last year. And in 96, he was sixth. He was third in the Tour of Flans in 95. He was third in 1994. He's a man you've got to mark. You can always count on Andre Schmier when it comes to these very tough cl classics, you know. Ones with the cobblestones, Paris-Roubaix, Tour of Flanders, he's always there. He has never won the Tour of Flanders, but Paris-Roubaix was a magnificent performance a couple of years ago when Johan Museo almost got to his back wheel and just couldn't close the gap. Now this is the top of the old Quarimoids, a tarmac road. You can see the, the commentator there telling us that in fact this is Surveys Carnarvon. Well it isn't, it's Peter van Pietergem riding for the TVM squad in the middle there, number 105. We definitely saw him attack when they went up the cobble section but the most important thing when you're riding a race like the Tour of the Flanders these days with the climbs being so competitive you have to eat as often as you can because you can't eat going up and you can't eat on the approach which is why Andre Schmiel is taking food on board at the moment. Well we're just about 60 kilometers from the finish that's 38 miles and there is the empty road except for that small group which is trying now to reach these three riders out in front. This little breakaway trying to get clear it's uh, built up on the climb of the old Quaramont and the Boscodin is here so too is Schmil and the other rider is Peter van Pietergum. Now here is the main part of the field that's trying to chase them down and some useful riders now in this breakaway as well. Number 121 there is Rolf Sorensen, the Rabobank boy, who, as Paul has said, is ever present in the racing this year and surely looking for the win today. This race does suit Rolf indeed, as do most of these early classics. He's that style of rider. And David uh, Casarotto from Scrinio is also in that move. Well, you can see once again the old Quarimont has definitely had an effect on this race. A lot of riders now scrambling to try and get back into the race, scrambling to, to try and get up to that leading group of 20 or 30 riders. Interesting to note, Johan Muzer was there, he wasn't in any difficulty at all. He's looking around at the moment, I suppose, to see how many of his teammates managed to get over that climb with him because he will want as many men around him going into the final phase of this Tour of Flanders. But most of the big leaders were there. Michele Bartoli was there, I noticed, wearing number 31 and last year's winner. Normally when you ride one of the races like this, if you're the previous year's winner, you get number one. But because Johan Museo is a Belgian, because he is the world champion, he's wearing number one today. And he's got himself into a move. There's 19 riders come together here in the lead. And Johan Museo won't like the size of that breakaway. Now he watches very closely the movers and doesn't use his energy at this stage. He tends to let them all sort things out and then puts in his attack when it matters. Onto the Peterberg now. And this is another short climb. We're approaching just about one and a half kilometres away from it. There is the remnants of the big field. And they still have that lead group in sight. But they're going to have to do something about it now pretty quickly. Because I think once they get over the Peterberg, uh, they'll start to open up this gap. They must close this gap fairly quickly, I think. They have to do that because the, the climbs are so repetitive in this year's Tour of Flanders. They just come one after the other and this, in fact, is one of the back groups that look like Sergei Uchikov sitting on the back there riding for Polti. And you can see now there are still eight climbs to go and four sections of cobblestones. That's what the little graphic is in the bottom left-hand side of the corner there. But Johan Museo is in a good position. So too is Laurent Jalabert because he's in this group as well in the yellow jersey. So definitely all of the heads of state for the moment riding in this leading group of 20 or so riders now because it's swelling all the time but this is definitely the typical part of the Tour of Flanders these very narrow little roads around the Flemish farms leading up to the small narrow climbs mostly cobbles which is what makes this race so special and so different from Paris-Roubaix. Museo in fourth place of this little group by the moment 
And the riders are not overdoing it. They're not actually racing flat out, are they? They're just looking after themselves. Jalabur settled in and a little tap uh, on the left thigh of Jalabur by the world champion to say, I'm just coming by. And he's gone through. Museo will be feeling very content with the way things are going right now because this breakaway is thinning out the rest of the field. But as I speak, we've got a little group coming onto the tail and I'm not sure if the camera could pull back. Oh no, it's just the breakaway, so there's still about 19 riders here and they've hit the cobblestone of the paper Peterberg. And now, what are they going to do here as they start to put in big efforts? This is a steep one, as you can see, 20% uh, near the summit here. A good uh, casting off board indeed. And then we've also got this 400 metres of cobblestones as well. well. This is a tough climb. It was actually put in to replace the old Koppenberg, which used to be at this part of the race a few years ago. The Koppenberg was then decided it was much too steep because many of the riders actually had to walk up. This is Stefan Wesserman at the front, so we can only presume that Eric Zabel is in this leading group because he is trying to keep the speed high for his man, who is the overall leader of the World Cup at the moment. But Boscardin, I've rarely seen him ride so well. There's Ekimov riding for the US Postal Service, so he's done a good ride to get there. There's Jalabert in the yellow jersey. Last year's winner coming through, Michele Bartoli. So really, all of the heads of state that look very much like Frederick Moncassin going through there wearing number 91 and that on the back there I think was one of the Plankart clan and that'll be Joe Plankart. Well, there's the Gan rider so they've got their top there uh, I'm not sure whether you call Moncassin a sprinter or a stay really because he can do both pretty well he's an aggressive rider but he can pack a, a great punch at the finish and still we've got Bosco down at the front here and this is a very, very interesting group of riders now, and I'm sure the Museo and Jalaba are assessing their strengths all of the time. Jalaba comes through, just looks over his shoulder, and you'll see, in fact, uh, uh, Weissman, Stefan Weissman from the Telecom team, another young German rider who had a very, very good amateur career, now beginning to settle in as a professional. It looks like it's turning into a tandem there, Phil, because wherever Johan Museo goes, you will see Laurent Jalabert. Wherever Laurent Jalabert is, you'll see the Belgian world champion. They really are marking each other today. And at the front now, I think what is happening, in fact, is that's the shape of Andre Schmiel trying to force himself clear. It really is going to be a strange race because as we look a little bit further back here, you can see this is Bart Lazen of the Mappe squad. He's done his work for the day for Johan Museo. So that group behind really struggling. And you can see the race and the hammer really down at the front. Now there's a move coming through by Laurent Jalabert. Now that's surprising because there's still almost 55 kilometers to go. Well, Jalabert, I think he's got Bosco down with him on his back wheel. The two of them trying to go clear, but there's still plenty of fight left in that lead group. I think we're watching here the first stages of the establishment uh, setting up a breakaway here. And uh, rider number 43, well that indeed is Bruno Boscadam. By the way, you heard Paul say that he changed his nationality. Well, the reason he did that, changing over from Italian to Swiss, was because uh, he wanted to ride the World Championships and he wasn't getting much luck being selected for the Italian World Championship team. There's Museo, that white jersey of a world champion. Well, he's giving it a great outing today. He's showing it in front of his home crowd, and he would love... He doesn't make a big deal about it, but he would love to win the Tour of Flanders in the, the uh, rainbow jersey. Strange Tour of Flanders it is as well, Phil, because not only are all the climbs concentrated in the final 60 or 70 kilometres, but also it's a beautiful day. Normally the Tour of Flanders is held in rain and wind. There are hardly any riders left at this stage of the game, and today it's very dry conditions. Only a slight breeze pushing the riders across from the left-hand side to the right-hand side of the road. So it's going to be interesting to see what sort of tactics start to be adopted towards the end there. Interesting to see, though, that Joe Plankart has moved into this group because he's a great rider. In fact, his brother Eddie Plankart, his, his uncle Eddie Plankart, just recently said that he has got a lot of talent, but he doesn't yet have the confidence to put in the good performances. Well, he's got seven little climbs left in which to get himself up to the front and uh, show his uncle that he can ride and win the big races. Henk Vogels uh, tacked onto the back of this group and Henk now beginning to show signs of the class we know he has this year. He's come across to the GAN team and he seems to be settling in. His season ruined a bit last year with crashes and he didn't get on too well with Jan Raas and I think he's going to be a lot happier now on the French GAN team which is managed by Roger Leger and of course the team of the British rider Chris 
Chris Borman. Not to forget, in fact, there are three Aussies on that team as well this year. Scott Sunderland came across from Lotto, and he'll be joining Stuart O'Grady, who is on. In fact, it looks that is Moncassin looking now to see if he has any teammates in this group at the moment, dropping back to have a quick word with Henk Vogels. Vogels are a, li a little bit disillusioned, I think, last year with the way that he was treated after that accident that he had by ha Rian Ras and the rest of the Rabobank team. So I think this year he's really got something to prove. He wants to get out there and show that he is a rider with a lot of class, and he is certainly is to be in a group like this at this stage of the game in a race like the Tour of Flanders. A man I think Vogels will see a lot of in the future. I saw him race early this year in January in fact in Perth and he rode extremely well in a series of Criterion races there then he had to come over to the chill air of Europe and prepare for amongst other races of course the Tour of Flanders. Kortekia now is uh, 2.3 kilometres away and this group is getting slightly bigger. This is Ballerini, our man of the classics, uh, getting himself in on the action again. And uh, the screen row rider is David Casarotto, number 163. But interesting to note, Phil, there, number 61, the man that we thought may well have ended his career this year in Terreno Adriatico when he had to pull out. Maurizio Fondrias has had such a lot of difficulties with his back. He actually had a helicopter fly in a chiropractor to put him back into a straight line. And it seems for the moment as if his back is holding up because to be where he is he's obviously in great condition ballerini what a great man he's always there when it comes to these tough races and also maximilian chiandri was slipping into that group too what's happening at the moment is every time they go up the climbs the leading group are putting a lot of pressure on and then these riders are getting dropped off the back then the ones who are courageous enough fight their way back up to the leading group again and we get the same sifting out process happening every time we hit these climbs just inside 52 kilometers to go this little breakaway trying to establish itself but it's finding a great show of resistance from the back group there's the narrow roads again now as we head up towards the next climb seven small climbs left you see how flat Flanders is until of course we come across the little climbs and then you really feel as though you're in a mountainous region the two groups look to me as though they're going to merge here that's going to give us quite a big leading group for this stage of the Tour of Flanders it's something like 25, 30 riders are going to get themselves together down there. And there's still some big names who have made this group. It is nice to see Fondrias coming up though because he's had a great career. One of the few Italians who's lived in Belgium uh, because the Italians really don't settle down in Belgium. It's a different culture, different type of food and really they're unhappy. Stuart O'Grady, a couple of riders up the line here, also a member of the GAN team. Another rider, you know, they talk about Stuart as being a real, real talent. And I think perhaps in the next two seasons we're going to find that to be the case. I think he's very happy too, the fact that Hank Vogels has come across to join him. They really have knitted well into this GAN team. The GAN team has changed an awful lot over this winter, many riders changing because French cycling has really come to a resurgence with the formation of the Francaise des Jeux, the formation of Cofidis, and also the strengthening of the Casino team, which is why a lot of the GAN riders actually left. But they've brought on board a lot of foreign riders with obviously Hank Vogels and Scott Sunderland, but also Eros Poli, which I think is why we're seeing this team from GAN being much more competitive on the international circuit. They really are a force to be to be held high in a race like this. In fact, one of them going clear now, and it looks very much as if that is, in fact, Stuart O'Grady. I think it is, and uh, O'Grady looks over his shoulder and finds that, in fact, uh, it's not going to be for him just yet, as we've got an attack by one of the Asics riders here who's got him to this breakaway. It's Kim Pucci. Is it? It's <laughs> unbelievable. This I really is... wasn't expecting to see him at all. I thought it was the round shoulder of Kim Pucci, but he must have come up in that second little raiding party that's just joined on to this group, and he's gone straight to the front. Well, that's really nice to see, because this year, Claudio Kim Pucci is beginning to give us little flashes of the form that he had a couple of years ago. And now he's got himself right to the head of the main field in the Tour of Flanders. Well, he certainly doesn't mind going to the front of a race but strangely enough he is the kind of rider who normally we would wait till the Tour of Italy or the Tour de France to see him performing but the Tour of Flanders is a very special race it's a race where you have to have a lot of courage you never have to give up you have to keep fighting to bring yourself up to the front of the race all the time and it's interesting to see Phil how many number ones there are on the numbers of these riders showing that most of the leaders of the teams are in this leading group there that was a quick look there of Fondriest and Maximilian Chandry but again we're coming to one of the other little climbs and every time the pressure is being put on at the front and Jalabert going again. Jalabert has got so much power. He really is a strong rider, but again, it's the tandem Jalabert-Museu. 
And we're on the climb now, Kortakir and Jalaba is trying to get something moving here. He wants to thin out this breakaway group and Museo knows that when it's time to pay attention, he's climbing second in line here, following Laurent Jalaba. The world number one and uh, he really deserves that title he's the most consistent season-long rider and uh, Mugeo right behind him he has had a tremendous last couple of years winning the world cup twice the world championship uh, just a matter of a week or so after saying he was going to pack the sport in so there they are and now they've stretched it out just a little bit this might be the start of the move well one man trying to get across there was last year's winner Michele Bartoli he can see the danger he knows just how strong these men are and it looks to me as if one of the lotto riders is going to come across there too and if it is one of them it's probably going to be Joe Plankart because Andre Chamil is just so much lower and more compact on the bike. I would agree this is a bit too big and it is in fact uh, Joe Plankart who's joined them so there's four riders out in front and they've got themselves a nice little gap here two Belgian riders uh, one Italian and a Frenchman and the world number one is there and the world champion is there as well and last year's winner of this very event so Joe might feel a little bit claustrophobic out there at the moment Paul I don't think we'll see him doing very much work because he realizes that his man the man from the lotto squad is Andre Schmiel he'll be looking at this group now saying what am I doing here maybe my uncle Eddie was right that I do have a little bit of talent but I'm not gonna show too much at the moment because these three men in front are the heads of state and I'm just slowly climbing up the ladder but Bartley's forcing him there you see to come to the front Bartley doesn't want any passengers because this is a crucial time of the development of a breakaway you have to open up the gap to begin with which is why you see Bartley just let that gap open forced Joe Plankart to go to the front and Museo now not asking anybody to help help him he's at the front keeping the pressure on which is quite remarkable because there's still over over 45 kilometers to go and these riders have decided we're going to open it up now but again reaction coming from behind and there's Andre Schmil wearing the leaders uh, number 171 of the team. He's in the second group on the road. And number 184 there is Ekimov. Chance to get a good look at the blue colours of the new US Postal Services team. A team that's having a reasonable amount of success at the start of the season with great uh, stage wins in Paris-Nice. And what everybody would like to see is that they get a wild card into the Tour de France. 12 seconds at the initial time check here on four of the best bike riders around and that backfield is going to have to do something about it pretty soon because they're running out of hills now the Tienberg is the next climb to come and after that there's only five climbs down to the finish it's a long time since Laurent Jalabert has been to ride the Tour of Flanders. In fact, the, the Onse team have actually refused to ride it on several occasions because they felt it was too difficult. But now, a lot of pressure being put on the top teams in the overall rankings to take part in all of the rounds of the World Cup. And Jalabert has said that if he's come to the Tour of Flanders this year, he's come because he wants to win it. This is an event that he, in fact, does enjoy. It's a tough race. It's a race where you have to be at the front all the time. But those four riders not opening up much of a gap at the moment. And I think because there are so so many individuals in that group behind that they will start to work together and they'll pull back slowly on this leading group of four riders. And I think when you get three great riders up there like uh, Jalabert, Bartoli and Museo, they're a little bit cautious with each other. They don't really want to declare just how well they're going and the tendency is to slow down rather than go quicker. And as a result, I think this field is coming back to them. We mustn't forget either, you know, Bartoli uh, took the bronze medal in the World Road Race Champion last year and Museo was the excellent and very convincing lone winner in Switzerland. Well, that, on the back there, the telecom rider was still Stefan Wesserman. In fact, information coming to us that the overall leader of the World Cup is not in this group at the moment. The man who won the first round in Milan San Remo, Eric Zabel, he's had a hard time. He keeps slipping off the back in this group. The uh, telecom team were doing a great job early on bringing him back all the time, but you can only come back so many times. At the end of the day, you just end up losing all of that nervous energy which you need to just keep attacking and fighting your way back to the front. The four leaders still working but as you say Philip they don't seem to be completely dedicated to the success of this breakaway at the moment looking over their shoulders they realize that they're not really opening up an awful lot of a gap no and I think Zabo is probably feeling the pressure of being the World Cup leader at the moment he has tremendous form and uh, certainly he's got himself something like uh, seven wins already this season
Joe Blancart there knows yeah. this is the Tyenberg and he's decided he wants to be the first one onto the pavement. You can just see down the right hand side of the road there, there's a little drain which is the smoothest part of the road which is why he wanted to get onto that just so he could keep the bike rolling along. What happens in the group behind is you actually get forced and obliged to ride on the cobblestones and it's very difficult indeed. You see that's why the riders are hugging down the right hand side of the road there but he didn't catch out Johan Museo and Laurent Jalabert because they were waiting for something like that but I think by the top of this climb it may well be that that group from behind will just get onto the back. Well this group are strung out on the far right the last man in the line is Leon van Bon of the Dutch Rabobank team and they're going to have to do something now about chasing back these four riders. There's Plancourt dropping back as the acceleration being picked up here by Laurent Jalabert. He's going to test them. Jalabert's opened the gap he noticed he didn't have Museo on his wheel he had Plancourt instead and he has gone forward. So the Timeberg maybe it is proving a little bit decisive as Jalabert now goes out onto the attack. Well, you know, almost 10 years ago, the Tour of Flanders took out of the race route one of the most famous climbs. It was called the Koppenberg, and I suppose they took it out, A, because it was too narrow, the vehicles and the riders did tend to get tangled up, and it did, I suppose, in the end, affect the race in an adverse fashion. But well, we thought you might like to see a little bit of the chaos it reigned when that part of the race was intact. And Paul Schoem is out there as well. But although the Quarimor is still a very strategic climb, one of the most legendary and dramatic was obviously the Koppenberg. It was here that the men like Eddie Merckx and Roger de Vlaming laid the foundations for their great victories. But in the evolution of cycling, the, the modernness that came into it, it was deemed to be a lottery from the past because only the top 10 or 15 riders could actually get across it. The rest were very often forced to put their feet down and walk like I'm about to do now. Well, I'm not going to laugh, Paul, because I know just how hard it is. Let's have a look now at the race in 1984, the year Johan Lammertz won and spoiled Sean Kelly's dream of ever winning this event. Phil Anderson was on the attack here as the riders now were in absolute chaos on the climb. Paul, you've done this yourself. Well, one of the big problems that happened on the Koppenberg was it actually became a team tactic to send one man out there to fall off and lie across the road and give five or ten riders the chance to ride away and open up an easy gap. <laughs> well, I suppose that was one good reason, of course, to take it out of the itinerary. Riders continuing to shoulder their bikes and walk up the hill. And in fact, with the arrival of plastic shoes, of course, it made it almost impossible. In fact, many riders actually cut out and stuck on pieces of leather to give themselves some grip on the climb. Only the leaders really got to see this climb, which was extremely steep. That's Sean Kelly on the right, and the photographer wasn't ready. What a surprise. You see the riders can't stay upright at all here. Marc Sergent, who was always a great rider in the Tour of Flanders, always grateful for a push here, as the man in yellow, a little bit out of control. Step this way, sir. And the riders themselves continue. That's Henny Kuiper, the winner in 1981, shouldering his bike and deciding to walk up Sir Daisy. And that's not like Henny, he's normally a great gentleman. Anyway, struggle on they do, and you can see probably now why they did have to take this climb out of the itinerary of the Tour of Flanders. But it was a great uh, place for the spectators. And there's Paul Sherwin, he always rode it this way. And with him is Laurent Fignon, the winner of the Tour de France in 1983 and 1984. So that's the story, a brief story of the Koppenberg. It was also where Jesper Skibbery member was knocked off his bike by the race referee and his bike was run over by the car. Now we're looking at Rolf Sorensen. 45 kilometres to go and Sorensen is trying to catch the leader and Jalabert now seems to be clear on his own. Well, Jalabert is doing an incredible ride there but I think he will be happy if Sorensen can get across to him because there is quite a bit of wind starting to pick up there out on the course and if two men can get together then they do have a chance of opening up a gap but you can see just exactly who is doing all of the work behind the man in the white jersey with the world bands that's Johan Museo this is Sorensen trying to get across there Jalabert is really flying today he's come out with a vengeance he really wants to win this Tour of Flanders and now we have two men in the lead one of the Danes Rolf Sorensen he's joined up with the Frenchman Laurent Jalabert but you can just see the power of Jalabert he always seems to be using a monstrous gear over these short little Belgian climbs the ones that are rolling along once you get over the top it is still still hard. You still have to have the power to keep the gears rolling over but I'm sure they're not going to let Jalabert ride away from the race at this stage of the game and surely something must happen, something like a, an attack by Johan Museo because he's in good form at the moment and I'm surprised that he let Jalabert go clear over the Tyenberg. 
Well, I think Jalabert timed his effort to perfection there because he waited until uh, Musea was at the back of that group and that's the time to go. Number 191 here having a bit of a wobble on was Claudio Chiapucci. And it's nice to see him up in this front move at the minute. But Eric Zabel does seem to be out of it today because number 27 there is Weissman, Stefan Weissman. A good promising young rider, Stefan. I think he'll go a long way. And Boskodin is still here as well in this main group. It looks to be around about 30, 35 riders strong. Rolf Sorensen, though, has now joined the leader, Laurent Jalabert. Sorensen, one of the youngest riders ever when he turned pro in 1986. He was just 20 years of age, and he's had a great, great career. Three There's riders the began in this group, Phil. In fact, Studo Greda caught a glimpse of there, Henk Vogels and Frederic Moncassin. So the French team really have put a lot of numbers into this leading group. So they're the ones really in a short while who should take the race by the horns. And there is a race a leader at the moment, a Frenchman. So it would be interesting to see if the French team are going to chase him down. There's confirmation of the gap, the Museo group there, nine seconds behind. And all the time when we come up to this leading group of two riders, Jalabert doing the most of the work. They're making the big pulls at the front. Sorensen going through just to give him a little bit of a rest but it seems to me as if Jalabert's doing the most of the work well right now it's Sorensen who's got himself to the front and it looks to me as though those round shoulders indicating he's a lot of strength in those legs today the flick of the right arm to call through Laurent Jalabert Jalabert before he made the effort there just checked over his shoulder to see if it was worth going on well the gap is most certainly here and Rolf Sorensen who is a professional since 1989 He's now looking a little bit useful here today. Jan Ross having a good start to the year with his Rabobank team and he's had a few rough years with his sponsorships uh, in getting results that is. He always seems to manage to find the big sponsors uh, but he would like some results I think out of the Rabobank team this year. Let's have a look back as we go away from the two leaders now to see the chase group and there's a big gap there now Paul. Well, the last time check, Phil, was nine seconds, but I put that round about 15 seconds now. That looks like Ekimov at the front there for US Postal. This is Shandri coming through. But the strange thing about the race today is that there aren't too many teams with a lot of riders there, like Gan, who have actually got three riders who, had, who want to chase down. Somebody's going to have to take control of this because letting two riders like Sorensen and Jalabert walk away is a very crazy thing to do at the moment because if they get around about one minute, then they could really steal the show and two great bike riders they are and Rolf whose father Jens Sorensen by the way rode the Olympic Games in 1960 and his father often turns up at the events to watch his son ride he's always very proud when he's able to say Rolf is going well he has good form and he always tells us the truth as well Paul he usually does go well when his dad turns up well, Sorensen is a very consistent performer in fact he's had two victories so far this year he won the prologue of Tirreno Adriatico this is Shandri on the right hand side here he's going to have a go at trying to jump across too but the main field all over the there's Kier Pucci he's going to have another go he's not worried about the fact that the Tour of Flanders is a long way from the finish a little bit too slow for Claudio today so he's going to try and go clear there again he was covered by Andre Schmiel this is the composition of the second group there now you can see there are a lot of very good riders in this group Ballerini there for Museo, Wesserman, Bartoli, Boscardin and this young man Caserato who I haven't seen an awful lot of but he did start to ride very well last year a young professional but a man who may well cause some surprises later on well what the Belgians will have noticed there's only one Belgian rider in this group and that includes the two leaders as well and that is Johan Musea the world champion no other rider from Belgium is here that's going to make things a little bit difficult too for Johan he's going to have to work out some clever tactics uh, if he's going to handle this little lot today well, normally he would count on men like Carlo Bowmans and Wilfred Peters. Those are the guys who are usually around him in a race like the Tour of Flanders. The men who will just completely give their race up for him to close down gaps like this. But when you're on your own, it really is very difficult. The two leaders now seem to be working well together. Sorensen at the front, he's not really asking for any help at all from Laurent Jalabert. He looks over his shoulder, Jalabert taking on board some drink. It's so important to keep those energy levels topped up and very soon they'll be coming to another one of these little climbs and you see there Sorensen goes to the back gets into the slipstream a very nervous kind of a rider got a lot of acceleration but again you see just how difficult these roads are in the Tour of Flanders there 14 seconds so the gap is now Phil starting to stretch out well Sorensen who first appeared in the Tour of Flanders uh, with a good result in 1989 uh, he was fourth then and by coincidence that was the year that Laurent Jalabert took out a professional racing license and since then Rolf has had a third place in this event as well back in 1991 
Now, this is the reaction from the group. The Gantt team are doing very well. Henk Vogels is on the front here. We're heading now to the Stenneberg. And this is hill number 11 of 15 with a steep gradient of 8% in the middle, an average gradient of just over 5%. Sorensen is calling for a drink here and he wants it from his team car, I think. Well, that's the important thing. The day is very hot for a Tour of Flanders, so these riders want to keep topped up with liquid, and he is allowed to take liquid on board. Once the race has covered 50 kilometres and up until 20 kilometres till the end, the rider does have the right to take a drink from the team car. But at the moment, the gap is so small that his team car won't be behind him, so he's hoping that maybe the neutral service car behind him will have a drink on board. But that's also a signal that a professional will try to do so that the race referee who is behind them will call up the riders team manager and that's just a way for the team manager to get into the gap a little bit earlier than he would do normally. That's right because uh, the routine usually is the service car and one of the race referees will drop in the gap at around 30 seconds but the team vehicles aren't usually allowed in there till the gap is opened up to one minute and uh, Sorensen is desperate for a drink and that's going to detract uh, from his getting on with the racing here as he follows up on the Stenneberg as he rides gently behind there's the back group, and there's Andre Schmill on the left of our picture. World Champion Museo behind him. This is Henk Vogels. Now, this is Stuart O'Grady here. Henk is also in this breakaway. Leon Van Bon. And this is the composition. Van Bon will be doing no racing now with his teammate up front, that's for sure. Well, the orders obviously come from Mappé now for Ballerini to do the work for Johan Museo. He's come straight to the front of that group now, but he's only one man. He's chasing two riders who are up the road, building up a very consistent lead. 14 seconds was the last time check we got, and it's basically Ballerini trying to chase down these two riders. But it's interesting to note, Phil, that Laurent Jalabert now not taking quite an active part as he was doing earlier on in the race here. Looking down there, you can see he's on his small chain ring. This is a very tough little climb. The next climb they'll come to will be the Berendries, which again is one of the tarmac climbs but all the time these short, sharp Flemish climbs are sapping away at the strength of the riders. And the Berendries is just about 32 kilometres from the finish, which is 20 miles. But I'm not so sure whether Laurent Jalabert is going quite as well as he was here. He's still doing his share of the work, though, and still the gap continues. It's certainly a hard way of gaining a few seconds, but it's gradually gone up from 9 to 14 to 22 now. And uh, Sorensen looking extremely useful the way he's accelerating here. Stage winner in the Tour de France a couple of years ago in Montpellier where he outwitted Neil Stevens in a two-man breakaway. The Australian riding on that occasion uh, for Anse and of course a teammate then of Laurent Jalabert. But this year Stevo is on the Festina team. He's signed up for two years and that'll see him nicely into retirement I think. This is a serious group behind but still looking down it's always Franco Ballerini on the front doing the work with Johan Museo sitting comfortably in his slipstream none of the other teams really willing to work at the moment strange though that in fact Gann haven't sent two riders up there because they've got Frederic Moncassin who's got good form at the moment Henk Vogels and Stuart O'Grady so you would expect them really to to try and do some kind of a team role to try and pull this race back together but they're leaving it a little bit up to the other heads of state that was Michele Bartoli on the front there for the MG team now Johan Museo in person is being obliged to do a little bit of the work so this could be quite dangerous because if they don't organize themselves and that gap does start to stretch out as it has been doing over the last few kilometers it could be that these riders are going to see the Tour of Flanders disappear 25 seconds is the time gap now Yes, Musée will become a little concerned shortly, but he can't make his move unless the opportunity really does present itself, uh, other than on the small climbs. And so the next climb that we're going to see is the Berendries, and that's around about 30 k's from the finish. So Jalabert getting on with the job in hand today. What a great all-round bike rider he's turned out to be. His first big result came in 1990 when he was second in the San Sebastian World Club uh, Classic. He also, we came to recognise him back here in Britain when he took the yellow jersey in the Kellogg's Tour of Britain that year at Birmingham. And since then we've watched him become quite a big bike rider. But you see, Paul Sorensen still is wanting a drink. Everybody else is getting one nicely in the back group. That's the disadvantage of being in a small breakaway just 25 seconds ahead because normally they won't even put the service car in until the gap is around about the 30 second mark so he hasn't got anybody behind him at the moment to give him a drink so he's really starting to to make that sign all the time 
for the team manager to come up. These are the next climbs, Berendries, but more importantly, Berendries is only 15 kilometers away from the Mur de Gramont. And again, Claudio Chiapucci, these guys aren't going fast enough for him. He's trying to get away on his own, but Museo is covering the moves at the moment, as is Andre Schmiel. But th there's no organization in this group. Nobody wants to be dedicated, get to the front, all ride through and try and pick the speed up. So that could be to the advantage of the two leaders. Well, they're doing well to uh, stay away from this group because this group does seem to have a little bit of cohesion. Museo goes through. Now Leon Van Bon is in the line to try and just break it up. He's not racing through at all. But it's better to go through and hold the pace down than to sit behind second or third wheel and uh, earn the wrath of all of the other riders in the group. Schmill looking over his shoulder. Museo looks over his shoulder. They want somebody else to come and give it a go now. Vogels and O'Grady on the far side of the road. And that's Andre Schmill on the left of the road here. Well, having just said they had cohesion, I'm not so sure they have now. They seem to have lost the edge again. Well, there's definitely no organisation in this group. And really, the, the best way to do that would be for the two riders to come to the front. Schmill with his hand in the air here. It could be that he's just looking for a drink from his team car, an indication to the team car that he wants some sort of assistance. Johan Muzer were looking for some sort of assistance too. He's at the back of the main field here. He's looking for his team car. He wants to know what's going on behind. You see there, we've got 38 kilometers to go to the finish, 217 kilometers covered, but all the time these riders speeding up and slowing down, and that is going to play into the hands of the two leaders. Rolf Sorensen here in the orange jersey of Rabobank, and at last Manolo Sainz has got up there to give up some drinks. He's giving something up to Jalabert. He's taking on board a drink there, and probably a little bit of a glucose drink too. Well, I thought that was a look of disappointment on Sorensen's face when he looked around and saw the wrong team car had arrived. I think Rolf is still wanting a drink as he calls through Jalabert, who's loading up now for the final, what would it be, 35, 40 minutes of racing if they survive it to the finish. And uh, Sorensen won't want to be with Jalabert at the finish because uh, he would probably lose the sprint. So he's going to have to plan how he's going to get rid of Lance Jalabert if indeed he wants to uh, give Denmark a victory in the Tour of Flanders. Well, Johan Museo certainly got no friends in that back group there. Keeps looking around to see where Franco Ballerini was. Andre Schmiel was at the back, probably asking for some information from his team manager as well, Jean-Luc Van den Broeke. These two riders now on the hardest part of the course. It's very open here. You can always build up a good lead on the short, short, narrow roads of the Belgian Flanders because you can get around those corners a lot better than some of the big groups can. And you can see now these two riders have really taken the race by the horns. I was surprised at how many times Laurent Jalabert actually went to the front and attacked on these climbs. He attacked from an awful long way out. But in fact, Phil, I think the time check we were given was 35 seconds, but this group now seems to be pegging them back just a little bit. I think you're right, uh, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, about 15 riders in this group and it's becoming a very select group indeed. This is the long uh, main road approach now as we go on to the next big climb of the day. Good highway here but the sad thing is of course for the two leaders they are now clearly visible to that chasing group who will want to organise themselves and try and close down this gap before they go back into the narrow roads and of course the Mir de Gramont which is an absolute brute and is often the favourite hunting ground of Johan Museo. If they get back together I would expect it will be there where Museo will try to attack. Well, that's where Michele Bartoli launched his victorious attack last year in the Tour of Flanders. He jumped away on the launch pad of the Mur de Gramont and then just held it off over then the Bosberg. A very tough climb indeed. And you can see now the last time check was 26 seconds. It's come down to 20. So on this long straightaway, the riders in the group behind can see the two leaders and they're getting a little bit more encouragement and starting to roll through, which is why the gap now starting to come back down. So these two men have been at the head of affairs for an awful long time and they've never really got anywhere near the one minute which is a good safety margin that you need. Rolf checking exactly where he is here, he knows this course pretty well, although they chop and change it occasionally, a few minor road differences, but he knows where he is, the Berendis, uh, five kilometres to go to the next climb, and uh, then he knows he's not too far from the finish, once you're at the top of the Berendis, you're just on 30 kilometres from the flag. Uh, but the fact that they are not going very far away from that main field leads me to think there could be an awful lot of energy being wasted out here right now. We get a chance here to see the two different styles really of Sorensen and Jalabert. You see how Jalabert, when he's in the saddle, sits a long way back. He's a powerful rider. He uses real power in, from his, his pedaling action, as opposed to Sorensen, who turns the pedals a lot quicker. He's got a lot more suppleness. He's got a lot more acceleration on the little corners there. At, 
twitch of his arm there, twitch of his shoulder. Come on, Laurent, it's your turn to come through. Let's keep working together. That is something that riders do when they're riding in a team time trial situation. A flick of the shoulder indicates, I've done my turn, it's up to you. But this is a bit strange that he's actually pushing Jalabert to the front now. 33 kilometres to go, and I would say about 2 kilometres to the bottom of the Berendries. So the pair of them in tandem. It's worth remembering that this year, Laurent Jalabert won his first ever time trial. As a professional bike rider, he won the time trial stage in the Paris-Nice race and went on, of course, to win that race for a second year in succession. So he's certainly a third year, rather. He's won it three times now at Paris-Nice. And uh, I wonder if he's going to try and rival Sean Kelly's great run of victories. And very often we compare Jalabert with the style and riding of Sean Kelly. And they are similar in many, many ways. That is absolutely true. Anyway, the chase still very much on here. And Jalabert, I think, a little confused now. He's not sure whether to give it any more effort or to allow the group to come back and wipe him out. Ballerini brings through Van Bon, still doing a good job there. Claudio Chiapucci, Van Pietergum is up here again. And then we've got uh, Vogels and O'Grady, and this is Andre Schmil. And it's a good group. It's a, such a powerful group, Paul. Maybe that's the reason they're not coming up fast enough. They're all watching each other. But it's so strange to see one of the World Cup races like this with so many individuals. Everybody wants to attack and get away on their own. They want to get away in a group and they don't want to work together because there are so many heads of state of the world of professional cycling in this group. It's like having a bunch of individuals and they're all too worried about doing too much energy and giving the advantage to one of the other riders. Sitting at the back there, number 91, was Frederic Moncassin, and if it ever does come down to a sprint, he's the man who must have a serious chance, because let's not forget, he's a great sprinter, won stages in the Tour de France, Ballerini now, he's decided, I'm going to try and get across the gap on my own, and take the pressure off Johan Museo, force the other teams to chase. So the man who is one of the most consistent spring classic riders we've ever had has gone on the attack again. And no reaction, but remember he's on the same team as uh, Johan Museu, and therefore Museu will feel a bit relieved, he's got a man out on the move. Museu wearing number one, sitting at the back here. Can't be very happy at all with this, because normally the Mape GB team is a team which is dominant in numbers at this stage of a race like the Tour of Flanders. Remember last year in Paris-Roubaix when they finished first, second, third and fifth, they were so strong in numbers. In fact, the rider who's gone away here is actually Caserato, so it wasn't Ballerini. I thought Ballerini was the one who jumped, but maybe, in fact, he's trying to get across to Ballerini, who may well be caught in the middle of this gap. Well, we're going to find out. Our motorbikes picked up uh, David Caserato, 25 years of age, from Scrigno, and he decided to try and liven the race up. And that is Ballerini, in fact, up front, so you were right, Paul. And now it's going to be two Italians here trying to chase down a Frenchman and a Dane. Well, the Belgians are not going to like this because they've always seen this as their event. And their man, Johan Museo, is still trapped in the big chase group. But he'll take some compensation from the fact that he's got a teammate now out on the front. We're approaching the Berendries. 13% it is at the steepest point of the climb. Another little short one. But they're all hurting now as the riders come down to the last 34 kilometres of the day. Well, the Johan Museo may well be champion of the world, but the Tour of Flanders is regarded as the championship. Oh. And there's a crash, Phil. In fact, Museo has gone down. And that is Museo is down. He's been in collision here with one of the other riders. This is Bosco down who's trying to untangle his bike. Now, we don't know what happened. We've just cut back to it. It's happened in the chase group. And Museo, well, he looks as though he's caught, but no, he isn't. The bike's gone down now. He's absolutely fuming, in fact. Uh, he can't get his wheel back in because I think the gears are broken. And what has happened, I don't know. He's been in collision with Bruno Boscard in. There is Boscard in, also wanting help. I'm just wondering where the cars are, Paul. They're taking some time. Well, that's the big problem about the Tour of Flanders. When there are splits, the cars are a long way down. We get a chance here to have a look. In fact, Boscardin was looking over his shoulder, not paying attention. He's just ridden into the back wheel of Johan Museo, so that was not Museo's fault. He got caught up, I think, with his bit rear derailleur, and the two went down, and Phil was... Jalapé has been dropped. We're well, looking here, that we've gone back to the climb and we've missed the attack by Rolf Sorensen. Sorensen has gone clear, Ballerini has come from nowhere. He's gone round Jalapé. Jalapé, I think, has hit the wall here. 
and he's fallen right away from the action while Ballerini scampers up the Berendries trying to catch up now with Rolf Sorensen of Denmark. Well, this is a big turnaround and they can be completely unaware of what has happened behind. The world champion appears to be out of the race now, uh, brought down there by Bruno Boscada. It's the sort of accident I must have seen dozens of times, both among club cyclists and professions alike. You look to the right and your back wheel is collided into by another rider. And while all that's happening at the back, the race is changing its face at the front, but that is remarkable to see Laurent Jalabert drop like that. It actually reminds me of the Liège Baston Liège when he attacked at some hundred kilometers kilometers from the finish. He just won the flesh while on. He thought he was the strongest man in the world and that may be what he felt today. He was attacking from 45, 50 kilometers out in this race and he maybe has just over-assumed on his forces and now what has happened is Ballerini has come by him. He's got two riders at the head of affairs. Johan Museo struggling to get back up but because of the fact that that chasing group now will be trying to catch Sorensen and Ballerini and Jalabert who's still caught in the middle, it's going to be a very tough day for Johan Museo. There'll certainly be no shortage of support for him. The crowd now will know exactly what has happened. They'll have been listening on the radio and those that are lucky enough to now see it will cheer him all of the way. But the breakaway is now changed. We've got two riders up front and we've now got three. In fact, there are three riders now together now because Casarotto has just contacted up with Ballerini and Sorensen. While further down now, all of the cameras are going to stay with the world champion. He's Belgian, of course. He's the World Cup holder and twice a winner of the Tour de Flanders Museum. They're the three leaders Paul, two Italians in the kill now. Well, that's quite remarkable. Casarotto did a great job to come across to those two riders. When you see a man like Laurent Jalabert crack, you realize just how hard the race is. And Casarotto has ridden across there. And now the man at the front, Rolf Sorensen, has two different riders with him to try and help. The whole race could change now because I think there's going to be some confusion behind Laurent Jalabert. He's going to get picked up by the chasing group. They won't know where Johan Museo is. So it's going to be a time when the team managers are start, going to start coming forward, trying to work out some new strategies. In fact, the main field not very far behind. There's another group of riders. They've picked up Laurent Jalabert, so the race changing as we watch. Casarotto won a stage at Tirreno Adriatico this year, which is the build-up race to Milan San Remo. He's now contacted the leaders, while Laurent Jalabert has fallen back. It might have given some inspiration to the chasers. They've at last found out that Jalabert is human and has cracked here in the breakaway. A little overconfidence, perhaps, because he attacked so early on. Number 105 here is Peter Van Petergum. He will take a lot of solace from that. These are the three men now dictating the pace. And the classic riders, Sorensen and Ballerini, really know what to do now because this is the situation they've been in so so often. Well what they'll be thinking about now is the next really tough climb which is the Mur de Grand There, Jalabert can't even stay in the wheel of that chasing group of what is now three riders. Michele Bartoli was one of the other riders. This is Kia Pucci coming through. He knows that the race is starting to split. He doesn't care about anybody. There's no teamwork involved when it comes down to El Diablo. It's just get it all back together because then I can try to attack again. This is the three riders trying to get across that schmiel with the red jersey. Tucking onto the back the TVM rider uh, Peter Van Pietergem and on the front Michele Bartoli, last year's winner. And Bartoli now beginning to put up a good defence of his title won last year as well. There's the lineup Paul just mentioned. And here comes El Diablo as well. Claudio Chiapucci is ripping across the gap. I must say, as we always call him the devil, which is indeed his nickname, his new colours this year for the ASICS team, with the black shoulder flashes, perhaps a rather fitting. And Leon Van Bom for Rabobank gets back in to try and slow them down if he can, because of course his teammate is Rolf Sorensen. And further behind, we now have the world champion trying to put matters to rights, and very shortly I have a feeling he might see Laurent Jalabert as well. He's even riding with the man that brought him down. Well, that's the strangeness of bike riding. You know, this is the man who brought him down. A moment's inattention when Boscardin looked over his shoulder to see where his team manager was, and he took out one of the number one favourites of the race, and now they have to ride together, hopefully as friends. Well, they've no choice, even though they're on rival teams. They've got to get back up to the action. I'm not sure they're going to. Um, because these three riders are working well together. I haven't seen any passengers here. There is Ballerini now at the head of affairs. He first came to start get results in the classic races when he was fifth in the Amstel Gold Race and third in Ghent Wavelgum back in 1990. And then he went on to win the end of season classics Paris Brussels and the Autumn Grand Prix. And he finished fourth that year in the World Cup. And after that, he's always been a great finisher in the classic events. And now Sorensen and the other rider, uh, Casarotto, are really enjoying themselves, I think, now, because they might feel they've done enough to decide this race.
Well, 28 kilometers to go and Ballerina I don't think for the moment will know just exactly what has gone on behind because this is one of the most confusing races for the team managers because there are so many small roads and so many small groups that they have a hard time actually getting up to the riders to give them the information. Some of the teams do use radio equipment to keep the riders up to scratch but I think at the moment Franco Ballerini is putting the pressure on trying to open up the gap to try and relieve the pressure on his teammate Johan Museo probably doesn't even know that he's on the ground trying to get back into the race. I don't think he can because the cars aren't around the leaders at the moment. Tenbos is the next climb and 11% average gradient. This is the town of Brackle uh, by the way which forms the bridge between the two climbs and uh, they're trying to settle in. They're probably lucky we are in the town because they're out of sight of the chase group at the minute. Now having said that here's Peter Van Pietigum who's now is he off the front because uh, we're not too sure where he is. Yes he is he's just gone away from that lead group and so Peter Van Pietigum trying now to reach the leaders. There's still only a few seconds ahead because they also are passing through the town here. Well, Van Pietigum is a man who you can see on the right-hand side just how he's risen up in the world rankings. In 1992, he was 719th, but with all the consistent performances he's put on over the last few years, he really has climbed up the standings. He's been coached ever since he was the Belgian national champion by Ferdy van den Hout, and van den Hout, I think, will be very happy today to see the way Peter Van Pietigum is riding himself. A top-class rider, winner of Ghent Wevelgem many years ago, and he realises this is the area where he's used to training. He knows just exactly where to put the efforts in that's the advantage that the Belgians have in a race like this and in fact he's almost got across to those three leaders well this is a fine piece of solo riding by Peter van Pietigum inspired by his victory this year in Het Volk and now heading up to climb number 13 of 15 climbs today but still two brutes to come after this the Muir itself and the Bosberg as well but he's going to contact the leaders very shortly we're going to have four men up front and Belgium will put a player in the first frame of the race massive crowd enjoying the Tour of Flanders over the last couple of years this race has become more popular than ever but Phil did you see how Van Pietigen went around that corner he knew just how much of a risk he had to take there he used the motorbike he used the outside of the curb every last little bit he didn't even touch his brakes he just wanted to get onto the back of that leading group of three riders so he could get into their slipstream so he can recover a little bit for the next kilometer or so because now we're on a section in between two climbs it's about 10 kilometers from the last climb there 10 boss to the Mur de Gramont. It's big open road that's why you have to be on the wheel you have to be in a group because otherwise if you're not you just can't close the gap which is why Van Pietigem just closed it at the right moment but look at this this is such a shame to see the man who has been riding so magnificently with the world champions jersey on his shoulder taken out by an accident like that that happened to him before and Museo now I, I think he may well abandon and not ride to the finish. Well he's riding along at the moment uh, outside of the top 12 and I don't think he's going to get back right now because this race is in full flight. The accident could not have happened at the worst time because sometimes if it happens on a climb you seem to uh, have more adrenaline, more urgency and you tend to get back but it's happened on a silly stretch of road wide open. He wouldn't be expected to, to fall in such a place and I don't think he's going to get back but we'll see. Certainly these riders won't let him back if they have half a say in the matter. There's four leaders now and there is the chase group which does seem to be coming back you know. This group still far from out of the action. Sorensen has been on the attack for a long while now. He shed himself of Laurent Jalaber, who's passed straight through and out of it. Uh, but of course, the men around him keep altering. And now Andre Schmill is going to try and bridge the gap as well. Leon Van Bon, he's doing a great job of being the Rabobank policeman today, uh, trying to stop these counter-attacks. He allowed Van Pieterman to get away, but I think he's managed to stop uh, Andre Schmill getting away. Well, this really is. There's uh, Yatislav Ekimov, the winner of the final time trial this year of Paris-Nice. In very good form indeed. He's a, an excellent rider and I think a very good addition to the US Postal Service. Maximilian Chiandri, a man who would very much like to put in a good performance here in the Tour of Flanders. But at the moment, and this looks like Stuart O'Grady going clear. O'Grady now for the GAN team trying to slip clear. But you see, Phil, it's the same tactics all the time. Nobody wants to work together. Everybody wants to get away in a small group to try and get across to those three leaders, four leaders. Four leaders now, and in fact it's Henk Vogels, Paul, who's just pulled over to the right. They look the same, those two, they're the best of mates, of course, and they go everywhere together, which uh, doesn't help a poor old commentator. But Henk is a great bike rider, I've seen him since he was a teenager, and uh, he's coming really good this year. He's dropped back, a little tentative attack has come to nothing. The big boys, the old hands, are now taking control of the race again at the frontier. 
But interesting to see some of the young riders in this leading group there. Joe Plankart coming from a very long list of cycling family. And back up with the leaders now, Franco Ballerini. Sitting nicely on the wheel of Rolf Sorensen and Peter van Piedegem setting the pace. He's now recovered from the effort to get across the gap and he's now taking his turn in the line. But we're still only talking seconds here and there's still every possibility a strong rider can leap across to this group once we get onto the steep slopes of the Mieux de Gramont. This road here is a slight incline. It's not even classified as one of the climbs, but after 240 kilometers, it certainly does hurt the legs. It's the climb that comes out of Brackel. When they get to the top there, you can just see the summit of this hill, and then it flattens out, and they go across a plain then before they drop down into the town of Gerardsbergen for the famous Mur de Gramont, or the Mur de Gerardsbergen. It really is a tough climb, and that is surely where the decision of this year's Tour of Flanders must be made, because it is the hardest race, the hardest climb left. And the most, uh, most of the vehicles that follow the race aren't allowed, in fact, to go over the climb because if they break down or stall, and then they quite literally have blocked the whole Tour de Flanders, so they have to be diverted as well. That's still to come, and Ballerini setting the pace at the front now, Van Pietergum, Sorensen, and uh, Casarotto sitting there at the back. Ballerini looks over his shoulder takes fourth in line there's nobody actually uh, dipping out of the work rate here as we drop to the back we see Hemp Vogel sitting now at the back of this group but they also are working hard Claudio Chiapucci having done his turn comes through to the back and that's Stefan Weissemann in the telecom colours Max Chiandri they're all still in this group uh, Bartoli is still here Andre Schmill Stuart O'Grady setting the pace at the front and this group still well organised and they know it, they're not losing much ground to that breakaway as Bartoli slips through on the inside of our picture there. Ekimov moving up into third place, everybody being attentive but it's always been the same tactics. There is Frederic Moncassin wearing number 91, he's a good man. If this group can come back together would stand a great chance if it did come down to a sprint but everyone's very nervous, nobody wants to work together, they all want to leap across the gap on their own just as Peter Van Pietergem did, a great move by him but it's going to be hard now because once they get to the bottom of the Mur de Gramont, if they don't start working, the gap that those three leaders are going to have is around about 30 seconds, and that's the kind of gap that, in this stage of the game, you can't just leap across. Now, there has to be a move, and it's got to come pretty soon, I think, otherwise those four might well have decided this year's Tour de Flanders and one from Belgium, two from Italy and one from Denmark and by the way if Sorensen were to win there's never been a Danish winner of the Tour of Flanders before and that would be another little tick for Denmark this small country in Scandinavia uh, which is turning out such great bike riders just now not least of course Bjarne Arise the winner of the Tour de France last year it does seem now, Phil, as if they have decided that with the Mou de Gramont just around the corner, they're going to start to work. They realise now that there are a group of individuals here. They're doing little turns at the front, everybody going up there, swinging off, waiting for the next man to come through, trying to keep up a certain amount of speed so that that gap of the four leading riders doesn't stretch out too much. Michele Bartoli must be thinking back to last year, and Henk Vogels, he must be euphoric at the company that he's keeping today. Yeah, he's really finding his legs now, and... Uh He's, he's living up with the best of them in these races this year, and that's good to see. This is the breakaway, still working nicely together. A Scrigno rider, Casarotto, he's done his bit. He's riding on the wheel of a Ballerini, and it looks as though a little bit of uh, a missed turn there for Rolf Sorensen as Casarotto goes into the line, but Rolf was taking a drink, and so I think that's probably why he took time out. A lot of cars behind these riders now, then that's an indication the gap is well in excess of 30 seconds. Here's our own guesstimation now well I wouldn't say well in excess of 30 seconds it might just be 30 seconds as we now have two climbs left and two stretches of cobblestones to come the climbs are the Mieux de Gramont and the final climb which is the Bosberg 21 kilometers to go and it's about 18 kilometers from the top of the Mieux de Gramont so I put that three kilometers to go before they get there but it does seem now as if this group has decided to organize themselves a chance there just to see almost 50 kilometers an hour there this group is doing behind so it could be that they're going to try and time it to perfection the ideal situation would be to work and then just bring back that leading group of four riders into the fold at the bottom of the Mieux de Gramont and then you can launch an attack and hopefully like Michele Bartoli did last year leap away to a lone victory but you see the team managers coming up giving them all the information shortly they will now have a good picture of exactly what is going on in the race van bon knows what's happening though he's sitting at the back because his man rolf Sorensen, is at the head of affairs 
Yes, he's done very well to hold his position in this race. He's the only Rabobank member left up here. All the rest have dropped away by the wayside today. And uh, he's just trying to hang on in there and annoy everybody as best he can. Although I think right now the legs are beginning to crack because he slipped right to the end of the group. Even so, he's still there. He's in a very select chase group here. And the four riders at the front are just dangling at the end of a long leash and it's a question about whether they will escape on the Mieux de Grammont or whether indeed this group will catch them up. And it's been a beautiful day's racing in the Tour de Flanders this year. It is a classic race and it means every sense of the word classic and today's been no exception. I know the Belgians will be very disappointed right now having seen their world champion brought down by an Italian. An innocent accident of course, it wasn't done intentionally and accidents do happen. Uh, but I wonder if Museo would have been in at the kill today and the Belgians would of course say of course he would. Well, I'm sure he would have done because he looked so strong. He looked very confident indeed. He was covering all the early moves. The only move he didn't really follow was that one of Laurent Jalabert. Well, that was a strange move because Jalabert attacked from so far out. A very experienced man here in the telecom team car. That's Walter Goodefer. Now, he's won this race before. He knows what it's all about. He's trying to give a little bit of information to Stefan Wesserman, whose job today was basically to look after the World Cup leader, Eric Zabel. But now he's got his own free ticket to ride his own race. And you can see on these big long wide roads how easy it is to see the breakaway in front of you that gives you that little bit of encouragement just to dig a bit deeper into your resources and try and close down the gap now very shortly they'll be coming into the outskirts of Gramont. These, uh, this is the psychologically most difficult part of the Tour de Flanders now. They've got the big climb ahead of them. They're feeling pretty tired from a long escape. They're on rather boring roads and poor service. And they know the big group is not far behind. So these are desperate moments for the breakaway. If they can just survive to get through Gerardsbergen, uh, then I think they have a real chance of victory. And Casarotto who's sitting up there nicely and uh, well he was the third man up here don't forget the fourth man to get across is Peter Van Petergum who's having a great start to the season the TVM rider and the TVM team has been a long-standing supporter of world cycling and it's good when the riders get into the moves like uh, Van Petergum here today Phil you were talking about the, the changes in this leading breakaway in fact only one man has been in this break since its instigation and that's the man in the orange and white jersey of the Rabobank he jumped across to Laurent Jalabert when he was in the lead so you know Rolf Sorensen has been at the head of affairs for an awful long time now and he must be starting to feel a little bit tired as Peter Van Petergum sits on the back there coasts a little bit just trying to recuperate a little bit because all of these riders know the final few kilometers of the Tour of Flanders they know how difficult it is and they know exactly what it's like trying to drag your body over the Mur de Grammont because just to put it into perspective for some of the riders out there the enthusiasts you have to ride up the Mur de Grammont on the sort of gears that you would normally put on a mountain bike absolutely right and uh, the riders making a left hand turn there and I was just thinking about Ballerini because uh, he hasn't been outside the top 10 uh, in all the tours he's finished in the last few years of the Tour of Flanders since 1990 in fact and so uh, he's a real threat now and he's due again for a big win former winner of uh, Paris-Roubaix and he was second in Paris-Roubaix too to but he thought he was. Yeah. that was quite remarkable yes. that finish there and he said he would never come back to Paris-Roubaix and a couple of years later he came back and made sure that he was actually going to win it but what a great player he's always courageous but the gap now Phil is starting to come down it's 10 seconds so maybe that chasing group are going to judge it just right and they'll just pounce on this leading group of four at the bottom of the Mur you see now these riders know that the Mur is just around the corner they're going to take this right turn they drop down a little bit under the railway bridge then they turn right again into the town and that's when the Mur begins and that's when they're all trying to just save themselves a little bit trying to save a last little bit of energy in fact the main group here is almost in the same straight eight seconds now it's really going to be close eight seconds and a little more than 10 miles or 16 and a half kilometers left to go and the call in the second group now Schmil it was the group Museo but he's gone from it so they've now named it after Andre Schmil and uh, that group down to eight seconds they can reach out and touch these riders now uh, they're very very canny these bike riders they've got this group now very much under control but they're waiting till the climb itself before they do the counter move and we are closing in on that climb very very quickly now three quarters of a kilometer to the climb it is a vicious cobble climb it's very narrow halfway up and it gets pretty steep as well and there is the chase group and they are going to plan a counter attack as soon as they see the slopes of the Mieux de Gramont. 
it really is awful the mood of Gremon because you come at the cobbled section and you're already at almost a dead stop because you come into the town here at the end of this street you turn left and the bottom of the climb is actually on tarmac it's a, it's a very smooth surface and you go slower and slower then you take the right hand turn and almost immediately you're on the cobblestones and it is so hard to get any momentum on that climb and the riders who are in the front now Rolf Sorensen particularly I think is going to be really feeling the pain in his legs because he's been pushing that big gear for an awful long time they're in the streets of Gerardsbergen the Mur de Gramont is just around the corner on the left hand side there's the gradient 20% which is one in five in the old terms and it takes you up to 92 meters above sea level but of course you're climbing from the basement here and so that's why it is so steep and there's the tired legs of the men who have led the Tour of Flanders for the past hour or so and certainly Rolf Sorensen's Paul Sherwin has said must be feeling something of the pace now although he's ridden a great race and he is a most aggressive bike rider too if he gives up he won't be a volunteer to give up it'll be because he really has quite literally hit the wall because the Mure de Gramont means of course in English the wall of Gramont well, the most inexperienced rider in this group is David Casarotto and he's actually over the last few hundred meters been setting the pace. These other three riders have ridden the Tour de Flanders on many occasions. They know exactly how to handle this climb so they've let Casarotto set the pace. Looking back you know that group hasn't closed it down completely and now we have to wait to see what sort of confusion is going to happen here on the Mur de Gramont. Now we're coming up towards the cobbled section. Ballerin has decided he's going to take over and he is going to make the pace that he feels comfortable with. Onto the cobblestones and the broken road services. The riders now are beginning the climb of the Mur de Gramont, led by Ballerini, followed by Van Pietergum, and then Rolf Sorensen, and dangling just a little bit off the back now is David Casarotto. The Italian uh, may not like this climb, it may not suit his style at all. There's a massive crowd on it. All of the race cars have been taken away from the climb. Uh, because as you can see it is so narrow and if we did have a problem with the cars this race would be totally ruined we certainly don't want that now this has been a most aggressive Tour de Flanders this year there's the uh, false flat because they nip over the top of that and they'll start again in a second up towards the uh, little summit of the climb and only and there they're coming up at a great speed because that is Andre Schmil now and Bartoli also going on the far right and this is back to the summit to the leaders now as Ballerini grits his teeth this is the 20% bit and Franco Ballerini clearly thinking this is where he can stamp his authority on this race. The field have got them though, they bridge that gap ever so quickly on the steep bit. Uh, Casarotto is the one to go first. Oh, and his legs almost stopped turning completely on that left hand bend. But now the race is coming all back together here. The strong men are bridging the gap. This is where Bartley went to victory last year, and it looks to me as though he's fighting his way back into the picture this time around. Well, Rolf Sorensen went off the back there. These are the two leaders. There's Van Pieter and Ballerini going through. We get a chance now just to see how much damage has been done. This is Sorensen going through a few seconds in arrears. Casarotto, and there was last year's winner Michele Bartoli. But these riders now are all over the place. There is Smeal, Kiapucci going through as well, Ekimov, and moving up there is in fact Frederic Moncassin and Maximilian Chianri. So this race is turning out to be a cracker. It certainly is, and these are looking down now on two riders, Peter Van Pietergum and Ballerini. They've got away. Rolf Sorensen has gone A-W-O-L by the look of it here. Casarotta, we've seen, has been swept up by the chasers. And so now there are two. It was the move by Ballerini that did the damage there. And he had to do that sort of move because nobody else... This is back to the climb. This is Museu. And he's still behind, but you get some idea there. He's not that far behind, but this has become a very, very lonely race for Johan Museo. He's rid himself now of the man that brought him down, Bruno Bosca down. He's dropped him on the climb, but I still don't think that the Museo can possibly contact the leaders now. Back to the leaders, Paul, and there are now only two. Well, they're not too far in front because that group there has been picked up by Michele Bartoli, and that might be the saving grace for Rolf Sorensen. Not surprising he was dropped on the Mur de Gramont. He's done so much work in the race so far, but Ballerini now must surely know that this is a great chance for him. There are the team cars that have been stopped they send them around the mood of Gramont so they can get in behind the riders when they come by and the chase group behind us seems to have splintered a little bit but in fact Rolf Sorensen is still in front with Casarotto and in fact they've been joined by Michele Bartoli 
Well, this has been a great ride, not just by Ballerini, of course, but also by Peter van Pietergum, the Belgian rider who is absolutely inspired today and he's doing well to control the front of the race. This is the long, thin line. The rider's trying to get back on terms and Gan still well represented. They're not thought of a classic team normally, Gan, but this year they have been very, very prominent, bringing on board riders like Moncassan, Henk Vogels and Stuart O'Grady. It's been a good move uh, by Roger Leger. And let's not forget, Phil, that in fact Frederick Moncassin served his apprenticeship in the Dutch team of Word Perfect, which later became Novel, so he knows how to ride these tough Belgian races. Yes, he does. We'd have to say it's quite unusual for a Frenchman. It's not their style of race normally, uh, but today Moncassin still has a very good chance of picking up a great victory today. Now, a little bit of coming back together at the front here. Ballerini and Van Pietergum. Van Pietergum coming to the fore this year with a win in the Tour of Mallorca on a stage anyway. Then, of course, the big one for him was Het Volk. But it looks as though this race is coming back together again at the front. And Rolf Sorison, maybe you know Paul, he was just being shrewd. He's not used too much energy on the climb. He's allowed some to get up to him. But he's now back in the very, very good position again at the front. This is what the Tour of Flanders is all about. You should never give up. You can get dropped on so many of these climbs and then you recover and hopefully somebody comes back and you can get yourself back into the racing again. But all of the work to bring Rolf Sorensen back there was done by Michele Bartoli, last year's winner. Now he must be thinking about last year when he jumped away at this stage of the game last year. He was away on his own. Today he's in a group of five riders. He's got a very strong man there with him from his own country in the shape of Franco Ballerini. So this is going to be a very interesting climb now because very shortly they'll be on the slopes of the Bosberg and that's the final climb of this year's Tour of Flanders. So it looks as though the question now is who will again be boss of the Bosper because that's the last chance now for the non-sprinters to break up this group in the Tour of Flanders. And it, the, I don't really look at the poll, there doesn't seem to be a weak man among them, does there? It's quite amazing. I think the weak man has got to be Rolf Sorensen because he's been at the head of the fairs for an awful long time. And nobody now wants to take control. They've got over the mood of Grammont. They know that the Bosberg is the next climb and they know that an attack here is the, possibly the final chance that they've got of opening up a lead over the rest of the main field. There's Sorensen sitting in fourth position. Casarotto is the man who's really surprising me because I haven't seen him in the final of a classic before and he really does seem to be rising to the occasion. Van Pietergem doing a lot of work at the front there. He he knows the finish and if it comes down to a sprint of these five riders well he must certainly be in with a very good chance indeed but Michele Bartoli I think he doesn't know what to do because last year he was on his own when he got to this stage so for the moment he doesn't want to attack he doesn't want to go clear he wants to try and encourage these other riders to try and pick up the momentum but what's happening is the momentum has gone from the group and I think the main group may catch them up again what we've got is five riders here appear at equal strength and now they won't attack one another. Ballerini's a little bit frustrated. The first to reach him is Claudio Chiapucci. I think if we were to pan right, we're going to find the majority of that group have now come across. There they are. A very select little group of survivors in this year's Tour de France, including Andre Schmil. And Moncazan is here. So too is Ekimov for the US Postal Team. And uh, sitting at the back there, just one of the riders, I think it's Henk Vogels. That's the group up front as we now head up for the last climb of the day. Well, this is where it's hard then, number 71 at the back is Maximilian Chiandri. Chiandri must try and attack, I think, to split up this group because this is the last chance of splitting the group. This is the hardest climb, this is the hardest thing that is left now in the Tour of Flanders and surely somebody is going to try and go clear over the top. There is a little bit of a split, but as you said, all of these riders seem to be about the same strength. Nobody has the confidence and feels sure that they can actually ride from here to the finish. Ballerini there on the right, in the middle there is Joe Plankart. Blancart here, riding out of his skin, riding with the heads of state of the world cycling. Look at that face on him, the courage. He knows now that this is the place where a Flandrian can really make his name. Well, good for Joe, because he's got himself right to the front here. This is Ballerini's big effort now to try and shake them off his wheel. But he's trying to ride them off from the front. Now, the Bosberg is not all that long, and I think a more of an explosive attack rather than a long, sustained effort uh, would be more effective. Sorensen has realised that Casarotto has cracked a little bit he's gone round him but I don't know where Rolf is finding the strength from today he's spotted the gap opening gone straight across the gap and I for my money I think Casarotto also is going to get back on as he comes over the top of the Bosberg so they're over the top Paul and there's still no signs of an escape 
Well, everybody's tried, but nobody's managed to do it. Ballerini has put a lot of work in. Early in the race, he was doing work for Johan Musel, which is why I don't think he had the power to explode anybody off his wheel over the Bosberg now. And it's so strange at this stage of the game in the Tour of Flanders to see such a big group. There are two riders there from the Lotto squad, two riders from Gann. So they are the men who've got to try and do something from a team strategy point of view. They've got to sacrifice themselves for one another. Bartoli there coming through. He wants to keep the speed up. That is now Andre Schmiel coming through. Now there is Ekimov moving up into second position. Now wouldn't that be one for the books if Ekimov could take a victory for the US Postal Service? It would be absolutely marvellous result for them, but if Ekimov's going to do it, I think we'll have to be treated to the famous Ekimov last two kilometre dash for the line when he'll try to go alone because that's the style of rider he is. He'll have no chance in a sprint against the some of the riders in this group and he knows it. It's a slightly uphill sprint when we get round to the finish. It's a right turn and a fairly long road to the top for the finish. And Ballerini getting a little bit frustrated now there's nobody really helping him and the group once again is reforming as Shandri brings back the remnants of the nine men. Well I think that in fact Claudio kirpucci has gone off the front and that's another man I wouldn't have thought to see on the top of the podium of the Tour of Flanders. As soon as it slowed down there Kierpucci figured well I'll have another little stab. He's had a couple of goes so far in the race and he's jumped away to try and open up the gap here and in fact it looks to me as if he's gone with one of the Gan riders and I have to say this time I think it's Frederic Moncassin so this is a very good move indeed. They've opened up a little bit of a gap and this could be the one that will take them down to Meerbeck for the finish of the Tour of Flanders and look at the panic now there's a group of three riders then two then three or four more nobody knows what to do it's a question of survival now closing down the gaps as quickly as possible because if you let somebody get 20 seconds then you're not going to see them again well there's nobody allowing anybody to get 20 meters right now. They just jump on you and chase you down and put you back into this lead group. There are nine riders now. Slowly but surely, that lead group has been whittled down, but nobody has found the effort that is required to win the Tour of Flanders yet. But it's good to see a great attacking race, and that's the way the racing's been all year this year. And now it's Casarotto again. He keeps yo-yoing off the back, and then he keeps racing back into the action once more. This is a very, very good race this year. Well, what a man he is. I think he must certainly be the revelation. This is Andre Schmiel coming onto the back. He's being very attentive. He knows how dangerous it is at this stage of a race like the Tour of Flanders. Peter van Pietergem using the motorbike, closing down to get onto the back of that line of six. This is Ekimov now. Ekimov's waiting. Now he's going to go. What a move by Ekimov. He waited for it all to come together. Now he's gone down the right-hand side and he might just get the pause that he needs. Well, that's a very predictable Ekimov attack. He's won races in it, including stages in the Tour de France with this very same move. And the right I think are wise to that sort of move now he would have been expected to do this and they're straight after him here and again the break is spread eagles right across the road Ekimov has been caught immediately and now is it going to all come back together or not well, that's Ekimov from Casarato again. Casarato's there, but he was chased down by a Russian, a former Russian, I should say. Now he's from the Ukraine. This is Andre Schmiel. He knows exactly what sort of moves that Ekimov is going to make. He raced with him on the national squad. He pegged him back, and again, it's nine riders together. Phil, this is quite remarkable because we're so very close now to Merbeck. Surely, attack is going to come soon, and someone will go clear. Well, there is an attack, and it's coming from Gann this time, and I think it's Henk Vogels who's having a little dig now as he moves off the front of the bunch, but again, everybody is ready for these attacks now. They're expecting riders to attack, and they're marking them very, very closely. It is not a pleasant pastime being in this leading group of nine right now because the, all of them are under pressure as they try now to organise yet another attack, and that Sorensen again has got in on the move. He's the middle of those three riders. And in fact, Phil, I think that was Frederick Moncassin went across there. It looked very much from the air as if it was Hank Vogels, but I think Moncassin got across there to Ballerini and Rolf Sorensen. Sorensen again on the move. Well, let's have a look. Oh, yes, that's definitely uh, Moncassin who sits there gritting his teeth at the back. Ballerini and Sorensen back in the action yet again. They're certainly telling us they are the strongest men out on the course, but as we all know, not always do the strongest men win any race. Anyway, they're dictating the pace and they've both got themselves in the lead. They will not be happy with the presence of Frederic Moncassin because, of course, it's his sort of finish, very much so, and he'll be pretty happy if he takes those two on in the sprint, I think. 
big problem now is who's going to chase. Henk Vogels is definitely not going to chase. It's got to be up to the two riders from Lotto. Joe Plankart was in there a little earlier. Andre Schmiel is in there. They should get together and one should sacrifice himself for the other to try and bring it back together. But when you get to the end of a race like this, it's so difficult to make that decision because you're worried about the strength that the other riders have got. If you do close down a gap like this, you open yourself up to a counter-attack and those three riders, I think, have moved just at the right time and the gap now has gone out to what must be around about 10 or 12 seconds. So, we've got another change now in the Tour de Flanders yet again. And let's not forget that Rolf Sorensen was the silver medal in the Olympic Games last year in Atlanta and he's now looking very good in a breakaway at three with Ballerini, a consistent classic rider, out there up front with Frédéric Moncassin and the GAN really do need a good result this year because the team is coming towards the end of its sponsorship. Now, a reorganisation, they're all thinking, what do we do? And if you hesitate just too long, then forget it because you will race for fourth place. These are the three leaders now, Ballerini, Moncassin, who seems to have been content all day with marking uh, Franco Ballerini. He may have pegged him early on as the man to beat today. Well, now he's got in what does appear to be the decisive three-man move as Sorensen drives through. He is showing tremendous effort and strength out there today and we're just barely seven kilometres to the finish of the Tour de Flanders and you still can't pick a winner. Well, the important thing for Sorensen, he realises that if he can get this group clear, the lowest position he can finish in is third position. So he's going to drive it because he knows now what's going on in the group behind. People don't want to make the effort. There's nobody to organise the chase. So if he can just keep this leading group of three riders working together, then they'll open up the gap. And it looks now as if it has opened up. And you can see, Phil, there's no organisation in this group. The Lotto team car is there trying to tell Schmiel, I suppose, to pull it back together for Joe Plankart because Plankart's got quite a good sprint when it comes down to it. Well, I think they're making a big mistake now because one of those Lotto boys should have done something because the gap has opened. There is a counter-attack coming. It's not coming from the Lotto team. As Peter van Pietergum is the rider to the right of our picture here. We've still got Ekimov in this group. He's just in front. And it was Casarotto who tried an attack right up at the uh, head of this little group. But again, it's all come together. Now you're seeing the freewheeling. The team cars are scurrying up here, trying to get to their charges and encourage them to do something because they can sense now, as we can, that we're now looking down on the three riders who will decide this year's Tour of Flanders. And in fairness, Paul, two of these guys have been the strongest men in the race. Well, Ballerini has worked not only for himself, but for Johan Museo. He's put a lot of effort into this race, and you cannot fault the race that Rolf Sorensen has done either, because he was the one who saw the dangerous move by Laurent Jalabert earlier on. He jumped across to it. He dropped Jalabert when Jalabert blew up on the Berendries, and he's always been present at the front. Moncassin, on the other hand, has ridden a very clever a race very quiet indeed like a sprinter would do he stayed out of the wind he stayed in the shadow and the shelter of the peloton and waited for the final move and as soon as it came there it was he was in it now they're at 17 seconds ahead of the group with uh, Andre Schmiel and it's going clear now I think this has decided the race it's only a question of which one will be the first over the line to take the Tour of Flanders uh, Ballerini's been knocking on the door of this race for the last seven years but he's never quite got there first uh, Sorensen has never never appeared on the winner's podium either, and neither has any Danish rider. And the other rider, Frédéric Moncassin, well, that would be some result for the French, especially in this event. Well, the last man to win for France, I think, was Jackie Durand, but was. that was after <laughs> a very long breakaway, not winning the race in true style as these men are doing today. Less than five kilometres to go there, so that's going to take around about seven and a half minutes. Now, the two riders who are sandwiching Frédéric Moncassin now must be thinking to themselves, well, Moncassin is the top sprinter. If we want to win this race, one or other of us is going to have to get clear because that's the only way to beat the Frenchman. The Frenchman is one of the best sprinters in the world and he will know that. Moncassin will know that the two riders are going to try in the last kilometre or so to attack him and launch a surprise attack but he's waiting for it all the time. You can see his head tilting trying to feel some kind of movement of air to give him an idea of what's going to happen next. Well, I think if I was uh, anybody now, I'd just make sure that Moncassin doesn't get an easy ride to the finish because he is such a strong finish in this type of race. He's not one of the world's fastest sprinters, but he's a specialist sprinter when he has to be. And I think the finish uh, at Mia Baker will suit him slightly uphill, but you've got to read it spot on because if you don't, uh, then you'll misjudge how far the finishing line is over the hill itself. Now, three riders and still Sorensen putting an awful lot of weight behind those pedals and never a man to share 
Turkish duty at all. Goes through, swings off. The other two, we have to say the same now. As we're running down to the last few kilometres, we are virtually in Mirbeka here. We go right through the town, then we turn right for the finish, and then they will see the banner on top of the little rise. There's the gap. I think it's safe to say at this point that these three riders are now clear of the rest of the race in the Tour of Flanders, providing they don't start playing the cat and mouse tactics where they look at each other, they lose momentum, because for sure that chase group will be on them in a flash. Well that's a serious gap that they've got now and I can't see anybody who's going to dedicate themselves to chase down these riders. Franco Ballerini looks very strong to me, he's looked strong all day, he's never shirked his work, he's ridden perfectly for Johan Museo when Museo crashed there in fact is confirmation that they're doing a good job. 28 second is the gap now over the Schmiel group. Sorensen has got an awful face on him at the moment, a mask of pain as he grits his teeth knowing he's just got to stay with these two other riders if he wants a chance of winning this race, the Tour of Flanders, but he knows I think that the strongest man is Franco Ballerini, he's not going to let him get too far away, but he knows also that wearing number 91, the Gan rider, the sprinter from the Tour de France normally, is a man that if he gets to that finishing straight in Meerbeek, has got a great chance of taking the glory. I couldn't agree more, and as I said earlier, it would be a great result for Roger Lezay's GAN team. Right now, they need a big result. But we're going under the banner here, and it says three kilometres from the finish, and that is no distance at all. Inside, two miles to go, and in fact, Moncasan now wants somebody else to come through. The turns are getting shorter as the riders start to plan their own attack to the finish. Ballerini goes through, keeps the pace high. Sorensen has chosen to follow Ballerini in the line. Ballerini has chosen to follow Moncasan. Now he knows the power of Moncus and these three riders know each other inside out. They race against each other in all of the classic races, including the Tour de France. So they are well known. Moncus was the rider a couple of years ago, by the way, who fell off the uh, initial podium in the Tour de France when the teams were being presented and he broke his ankle and therefore was unable to start the Tour. Uh, well, things are better for him now and he's continuing a very, very useful career indeed. An excellent sprinter, a man we will see an awful lot of when it comes to the Tour de France this year. Loosening off his, uh, his back brake there, that's a very good trick that a lot of sprinters do there because at the end of a race like this, especially over the cobblestones, the wheels can get a little bit buckled and he doesn't want anything touching those brake pads when it comes up to the final sprint. So that was definitely a sprinter's reaction there. You saw him doing that ballerini there moving up. You can see the speed of these riders now. Sorensen is still gritting his teeth to stay there. Ballerini hasn't changed his style at all over the last 15 kilometers. He looks just so powerful. And you know, when it is a group of three, Phil, it is so difficult to judge the sprint. Two Ks to go. It's interesting though, Paul, because Ballerini and Sorensen, they train together in Tuscany because Sorensen lives in Italy and uh, they know each other so well now and friends are suddenly having to become very serious rivals here. At the end of this two kilometres, there's a very big goal at hand and that's the Tour of Flanders, so friends can become enemies as well. Sorensen dropping back into third position here now. These two riders, I'm sure, must be trying to plan some kind of attack because you can't take a man like Frederic Moncassin to the finish quite so easily as they have done so far. 28 seconds is the gap back to that chasing group now and I think it's all over for them. They'll be fighting it out for fourth place, but Sorensen still coming to the front, still coming, keeping the pace up. They don't want to slow down at all and as you said, they don't want to bring the cat and mouse tactics, but you see now a flick of the wrist there by Sorensen and Ballerini's just starting to drop back. Yes, and he was thinking of it and he thought it, but you see Moncasen saw him coming. He just looked over at the right time there and this is the right turn and I think that uh, Ballerini, a little bit unlucky, he planned that move and now there's a long straight and then we turn right again but I think Ballerini just a bit unlucky because it coincided with Moncasan looking left and now it's Sorensen's turn well that's the time to go if one goes and it doesn't work then you try it and it looks as though there's no reaction at all from Moncasan he just seems to be concerned about the whereabouts of Franco Ballerini all of the time and this could be the winning move here Ballerini is frustrated and Moncasan will not go through there's no reaction at all from Moncasan yet he came straight after to Ballerini. Well that's remarkable, perfect attack by Sorensen, that was straight out of the textbook. Ballerini went first, 
Bronkasan came back up to him and then he just sat on his wheel and then straight away Sorensen went over the top. Now the onus is on Frederick Moncasan to chase down Sorensen. He's the fastest man in the group and that is why Ballerini is frustrated. He's in the finishing straight now and unless a reaction comes very quickly he's going to take the victory. I think we're about to see the first Danish victory in the history of the Tour de Flanders. Sorensen made his move perfectly here and that gap should be enough providing those legs of Rolfs don't lock up now. They've been in the thick of the action through most of the hills today ever since he countered the attack of Laurent Jalabert then he got rid of Jalabert and since then he's been coming to and fro to the leading breakaway this has been a well taken win by Rolf Sorensen of Denmark the story of the triumphant Danes go on and on last year the Tour de France are East now the Tour de Flanders for Rolf Sorensen the first ever Danish winner second place goes to Moncassin and it'll be a very disappointed Franco Ballerini who gets the third place and it wasn't so far back, was it, to the next men over the line. But then it's going to be Andre Schmill, who's always such a consistent classic rider. And Schmill creeping in ahead of Casarotto. For me, the surprise of the day today, the main field coming in, uh, Bartoli is there as well. And it'll be a long wait for the rest of the race. But this is it, the great moment of triumph, the third ever classic victory for Rolf Sorensen of Denmark. But this is the one classic race I think most people want to win, other than Paris-Roubaix. And Sorensen now can add that one onto his long list of great victories and he really is very, very happy. It's also a great result too uh, for the Rabobank team because this is the one they wanted and Jan Ross will be totally delighted. So Rolf Sorensen, the silver medalist in the Olympic Games last year, now the winner of the Tour of Flanders, and he's in the finish enclosure, and with him too is our Paul Sherwin. So let's get down there and find out what it's like to be the winner of the Tour of Flanders 1997. Yeah, this is my biggest victory whatsoever. And I, like I said before, I'm very happy. I dedicate it to my wife who's pregnant again, and to my little boy. And then a great thank for the team who did a everything they could they did it with their heart and that what counts Rolf there was one man we couldn't find this morning at the start where it was Rolf Sorensen yeah last to ride in but first to come over the finish well, this, has been a, okay. this has been a great ride for you you looked as if you were suffering in the Mur de Grammont but it all came back together yeah well we tried to get to the Mur before before the group behind I knew they were going to attack so but I had a little bit of energy left and uh, after Borsberg I I still feel good and uh, nobody was really better than me today so I'm, I'm thanks for what I did. Were you a little bit worried when uh, Frederic Moncassin came up? Yeah of course but I also knew that Ballerini and him would ride 100% because it was a big chance for Moncassin and uh, it's a big chance of course also for me and Ballerini and uh, yeah we had to attack so I knew it was either Ballerini or me because I could see that Moncassin was tired and uh, yeah finally this victory comes for me. For me this is the most beautiful race in the world and finally I win it. What a generous response there from Rolf Sorensen. I certainly he'll be celebrating with his team tonight. That's his third win of the season. The others, by the way, the prologue in Tirano Adriatico and the time to our stage of the three days of Depana. Well, Paul Sherwin, pushing his way through the crowd, has now sought out the Australian teammate of Rolf Sorensen, and that's Robbie McEwen. Well, Robbie, I spoke to you before the start this morning. You said uh, we've got good morale in the team because we think we've got someone who can win. But did you think that Rolf could do it? Yeah, we, we knew he could do it after last week at Depana when he won the time trial. A few other times this season, he's showed the form he's, he's got. Um, didn't show it completely, he's saving himself for, for this race. And uh, today we really worked well as a team. Uh, every time we had to pull at the front and bring it back, we did it. And, uh, and then Rolf took it away in the end, strongest guy in the race. It's, uh, it's great. But the Tour of Flanders, with all the climbs at the end this year, was a lot more difficult than previous years. Well, I wouldn't know this is my first one. Uh, I, I know I found it really hard, but uh, you know, all the pain was worth it in the end. We we rode well as a team, worked hard, and uh, and we've won. Victory for the Rabobank and for Rolf Sorensen. Here he is now, coming up towards that crucial attack. First of all, though, it's Ballerini who goes. Now let's ask Rolf Sorensen to describe what happened next. Yeah, well, I've been out there for a long time. With first with Jalabert and then with with Ballerini and uh, compete again. So I had a little bit of problems, but I could see that nobody could really do the big difference. And uh, so I saved a little bit of energy I had for the for the last 10Ks and I knew I had to attack, so 
but it's always difficult. This year I had no accidents, no punctures, no nothing. I was lucky, but I was very strong. Well, nobody could dispute that. The way he went in the end, the Moncasan simply refused to come round Ballerini, and so Ballerini was rather annoyed about that. But the victory going to Rolf Sorensen. In 1986, when he turned pro, he finished ninth in Milan San Remo. Uh, since then, he's won Paris Brussels twice, Liège Baston Liège, and he's had a third and fourth previously in the Tour of Flanders. Now he's the winner. So another great classic has come to a finish. We look down at Mia Becker, bathed in sunshine here today. A massive crowd. Cycle racing in Belgium is more popular than it has been since the days of Eddie Merckx. So as we say our goodbyes, come back soon because the classic season this year, I feel, is going to be an exceptional one. And still no victory yet by an Italian cyclist. Now before we actually say goodbye, coming up next on the programme, well we had a little fun and games around this classic period. Portion and myself took the bikes over there.